It will be reckoned to us who believe in him. So, uh, so when I was down at Camp Lejeune, you know, there's always chores to get done. There's always duties that have to take place. Every month, everybody is tasked with a duty, cleaning something or straining something inside, outside. It's just, there's a roster that's made up by the first sergeant. He does all that. Now, there was an opportunity for anybody who wanted to volunteer for any one of these places early on that was allowed. And, and a lot of guys did that because if you volunteered for something, you could get it done and get it out of the way so you don't have to worry about doing it the rest of the month, especially if it happened to come up on a Friday or Saturday night, most inappropriate time. There were these two guys that I knew, and I got to know better over the couple of years, who always volunteered around the first of the month, and they always volunteered for a duty that absolutely nobody would volunteer for, and everybody hated and lamented. And you would just approach the roster with trepidation, thinking that your name would fall on one of these Thursdays of the month, and always the third Thursday, no matter whatever else. And that was the cleaning of the latrines on the G4 range. And the G4 range was a large explosives range that I went to every day for years, learning how to blow things up. Lots of fun there. And they had latrines. Now, I'm not going to go into detail about those. I'll just tell you that, you know those white and blue boxes on the side of the road for the workers? That's what they are. They're just bigger, and they're more permanent. They're made of wood. And, uh, and to clean them took an entire day. I'm not going to tell you how, but I'll just say that by the time you were done, after the entire day, uh, you didn't want to get anywhere near these guys. I mean, they were like back where Frank is right now, and you knew they were coming. So on those days, those guys, if you're really lucky, got a different ride home. Every, we all rode in the back of a dump truck to go home, which if they got in there, at least we had fresh air, but otherwise they would get them in another vehicle. But they always volunteered, and it always seemed to be okay with them. And I never really understood. I didn't know them well at that time, but I did not understand it. Well, one... One uh, month we went out there, it was probably four, four months, maybe five months into the time that we were there, and, uh, and we, it was a Wednesday, and the gunnery sergeant said that the latrine would be clean today. And the guys who were volunt had volunteered to do it on, the, on Thursday, because it was always done on Thursday, on the third Thursday, which was that next day, would do it today. And those two guys got really testy about it. I'm thinking... So they did their duty, they did the thing, and that night, I remember hearing them talk in the e-club, and they were upset about it, and they made stuff about it, and the next morning, uh, they went back at it. We got there on Thursday, and they were all disheveled, and they were usually really pretty jovial on Thursday morning, getting ready to go do the latrine. I couldn't figure out why. Well, I finally found out the reason. See, every third Thursday of the month, and some others, but always the third Thursday, the master sergeant would come out to the G4 range, and there was nothing on the G4 range. There was a little... There was a little concrete building with a little classroom or meeting room in it, a little office in it, but there was no water, there was no sewage, there was just electricity in that one building. The master sergeant would come out and get everybody into that building, and he would teach a class pretty much all day long. Now I know why. They were going and cleaning the latrine all day long in order not to go to the first sergeant's class. Now the first sergeant was boring. There's no doubt about that. I'm sorry, master sergeant was boring, and there's no doubt about that. So I... I kind of understood. Now this sounds like a strange story to be telling in church about latrines, although I left a lot out. But I use it because I want to show that, that this pattern is the same throughout our lifetime. In everything that we do, something as, as menial or as, as displeasurable as going and cleaning a latrine. And that is the pattern of truth, faith, and response. The truth is that Master Sergeant was coming to teach the class. They had faith in that. They knew that was going to happen. He was going to be there. And so based on that truth and the faith in it truth, they went and cleaned the latrine. That was the action or the response to that truth. That's what we do with everything. We find about the truth about something. We know what that is and we have faith in it. What is faith and truth? Truth is the initial reality of an item and faith is what that truth is inside of us. Okay? So I know this is true, I know it's going to happen. Now, from that point on, inside of me, that truth is called faith. I believe that that's going to happen. So we have the truth, we have faith, and then we have a response. What do we do in response to that action? They went there. <laughs> the rest of us went there. 
This is exactly what's being talked about in the lessons for today, and it's exactly what's being talked about in this first lesson about Abraham, or at this time it was Abram as he's being renamed with Sarai to Abraham and Sarah. Now, long before this scripture passage, long before this, way back five chapters earlier, uh, God came to, to Abram for the first time. That was the truth presented to Abram. God's initial interaction with Abram, this is me. God's saying basically, I am God. From that moment, that truth was planted. Actually, it was planted in Abram earlier than that, but this confirmed it beyond the shadow of a doubt. That truth now in Abram was faith. Abram knew that God was God. And from that moment on, Abram responded to God in a way. That response was action. We just say faith and response, but it's faith and response is action. So that action took, faith, took Abram to another place. It took him over his lifetime to the changing of his name to Abraham and Sarah, where faith is reckoned to him as righteousness. Now, this, this does not mean that Abram did not make mistakes along the way. Certainly, if you read from 12 to 17, you're going to find that he made some pretty major errors. But he's human. Everybody's human. We all make errors. The, the gift that God gives us is that we, we make errors. We goof. And even though we goof, God takes us back. And we have an ability to get back because we have faith, because we know the truth. And this is what Paul is talking about in, this, in his letter here uh, to the Romans. And he really drives this home. This whole section in Romans is a theological reflection on Abraham and Sarah, basically on Abraham, but it's about the family unit, right? So he says to him, he says, Abraham and his descendants to the law <clears throat> did not come through the law, but came through the righteousness of faith. Now, what is this, this separation of law and, and faith, okay? So I'm going to make this up, really really um, ugly example. Okay, ready? So right here on this, right here is a piece of paper, and it's the law, and it says, you, you don't slap a child. That's what it says. It's the law. It's the law. So I got a little kid. He bothers me, and I'm like, oh, my, just want to give it to the kid, but I can't because the law says I can't do it. So what Paul says is two things is happening. One, the law convicts me. The law I'm looking at that, and it convicts me that I want to hit the kid. The, the second thing is, is that it actually affirms me because I want to hit the kid in the first place. It's the only thing that's stopping me is the law. And, of course, we all know what happens. We find a way to override the law. Come later on with faith, we're taught that, no, it can say this in the law. That's fine. It's over here. Nice little piece of paper. Got it. But when I have faith, and when it's God, when the truth of God re is alive in me, then I don't hit the child because the faith in me, the truth of God tells me that it, I shouldn't do that, and I don't want to. I don't want to hit the child because of the faith, because of God's truth. So the law convicts me of my desire or my action, even my intention, if I still wanted to do it somewhere in the back of my mind. But faith liberates me and sets me free from that. Once I rely upon faith, for the direction of my life. I no longer even want to do this. The law doesn't make any difference anymore. I don't need the law. It's still there, but I don't need it because what I want, what I desire, who I am, what I know in my faith and the truth of my life supersedes the law. It's what the law was meant to point to. Now faith and truth point back to the law. The law is more of a memory. The faith is what's active. The action is what is purposeful. So Paul says this, he says this, and then he moves on. He says, hoping against hope, Abraham believed that he would become the father of all nations according to what he said, so numerous shall your descendants be. What is hope against hope? I remember hearing that when I was a kid a lot and then later on. Hope against hope is a phrase that means that the hope in, in the world here means it's not going to happen. I can hope for it, but it's just so incalculably uh, odds against it, it's just not going to happen. But I still hope. I hope against the hope that is fatal in the world. I hope a hope that is beyond the hope that the world would tell me. See, you should not hope for that. You're getting your hope, you know the phrase? You're just getting your hopes up. That's not going to happen. How do I know that? Because you know, look at the world. Look at the thing that's going on over here. This is not going to happen. Hoping against that hope is faith. Hoping against that hope is what Abraham was doing. Abraham looked at himself, 99, and his wife was barren. He said he's going to have kids, and he's saying, that's the truth of the world. That's the truth of the way things work. But I'm hoping against that hope in faith, responding to the truth of God, that this is going to happen. This is who I'm going to be, or this is who that I am already, because God has told me. And it says, this hope, therefore, was reckoned to him as righteousness. So what is that? Well, we've already said it. This hope... And this faith that's reckoned to him as righteousness is, 
is the truth, is the action of the truth. So I have this faith, which is the truth, and now I respond to it. I'm responding as an action. My action is counted as righteousness because the action I'm taking is not an action taken because of me, what I want, what I like, what I desire, or what the law says. I am responding and acting specifically to faith, and my action in response to faith is righteous, not for me, but to God. I'm doing it because God has put the faith in me, that truth in me, and I'm responding from that place forward. So when I respond according to the faith, which is the truth, in righteousness, which is according to that, it's counted back to me as, as, the, as, a, as correct action in response to God because God is the faith or the truth that I am acting on in the first place. See that's kind of a loop? It reaffirms itself as you go. What this produces is what Jesus talks about in the gospel. See how these things just go together? So in the gospel, Jesus talks about, first we have that, this reputable moment for Peter when he skipped behind me, Satan, but we're not going to worry about that one because we just talked about it a little while ago. We're going to move on to say, if anyone wants to become my followers, let them deny themselves and pick up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who want to lose their, or lose their life for my sake, for the sake of the gospel, will save it. So what is he talking about here? Everybody receives the truth. Every single human being on the face of the planet receives the truth. God comes to every single person that says, I am God. That happens at creation. That happens at the moment of creation. I am God. And that truth stays with everybody on the planet, no matter what they do, no matter where they are, no matter what they say, no matter how old they are, it makes no difference. It is immutably, it is immutable, and it is printed within the context of our spirit. I am God. There it is. So now, my life is spent on, what am I gonna do with it? Am I gonna go over there and clean a latrine? Or am I gonna go to class? How am I going to respond to this truth? We do this all the time, too. We have truths in our lives, don't we? We have truths in our lives that we do not want to accept. We have truths in our lives that we don't want to face. And we spend maybe a little or maybe a lifetime covering them over, filling that space up, buying, building a mountain, a multitude of stuff to cover that one little kernel of truth, hoping against hope that if we cover it up enough, we'll completely and utterly forget about it and it won't make any difference to us ever again. And we're shocked after a month or a year or 10 or 20 when the thing that we thought was so well buried by the efforts of our lifetime poof, comes back like there's nothing on it at all, rears up and catches us unawares and how we want to beat it down and get rid of it again because the pain and the discomfort that it causes us, it's horrible. But it's the truth. And the truth will stay with us no matter what we do. It doesn't matter what we cover it up with. It'll always be there. So we have to do something. We either have to run away from it, which is covering it up, or we go confront it, which is the righteousness. So Jesus is saying, if you want to lose your life, you keep covering that up. Because if you keep covering it up, you're going to have to keep covering it up. Your whole life is going to be spent covering it up, running from it, moving stuff around, getting around it, avoiding it. You know, it becomes such an intrinsic part of who we are that we don't even know we do it. We start changing the manner of our life because we know that if we get anywhere near that, it's going to be present to us. So we're going to refix our spiritual life or the manner of life to move around it, to avoid it. Now, for the faith, for the truth of the gospel, for the reality of God, I am God, people do this all the time. They spend their whole lifetime trying to cover over the reality within them, this call of God saying, I am God. And they do it by filling their life with all sorts of other stuff, by their jobs, by their hobbies, by other faith traditions, by trying to find truth in philosophy or in medicine or whatever it is they're trying to find the truth in. But you know what the problem is? It always needles them. It's always there. It's always a bother. It's always a bug. It cannot be dispensed with. It cannot go anywhere because it's truth. So to leave it there, I lose myself because I spend my life focused on the thing that I'm trying to forget. And I change my life, always, I think, to the worst, in the manner I live in order to try to avoid it. I, I don't tell myself I'm doing that, but that's just the way it works. If I needed to get out the back door right there, and I needed to do it really fast because there's a fire in the narthex, and I couldn't go right there, I'm going to waste precious seconds running all the way around those pews just to get to the back. Oh, I'll get there. I may even say I got there in time, but there's no doubt that I wasted time 
by avoiding this spot. I just didn't realize it because I always avoid that spot. So Jesus says if we live our life that way, then we lose our life. We lose our life to the focus on this. But he says, if you don't do that, if you embrace me, if you come to me, if you look at the truth and you, t- and you come to the truth, then you gain your life. Because what did Jesus say? What sets you free? The truth. Truth sets us free. So not only are we free from this thing that we're trying to hide, but we're free beyond this thing that we were hiding. Because the truth is made manifest in the person of God. That's forgiveness. That's enlightenment. That's joy. That's wonder. That's all the things that we want in our life that are held back by the thing that we've buried under all the clothes and dirt that we've placed there. This is setting us free. Now we're able to do and go things. We don't have to worry about it anymore. I talked to somebody a little while ago, well, it's probably about six months now, who was living a lie for years, like 30 years. And he came to me because he said, I can't do it anymore. I can't. Like, I can't believe he did it for 30 years. And with him for about four months, I worked with him and a couple of other people, and he finally told everybody in his life. And I didn't see him for a long time, and he came back. You know what he said? I feel so good. I feel so light. I feel so clean. I feel like I'm living for the first time because I didn't realize my whole life long I was living to hide this lie and it became a part of who I was and now I'm free. And I, said, I remember right in the portico right there saying the truth has set you free. Jesus didn't just say this stuff. <laughs> this stuff means things. This is real. So you say, oh, but Father Bill, What does this have to do with the cover of our bulletin? Did you see the cover of your bulletin? It says, worship is all about about him. That's the first one. And then the second one says, why worship is all about God, is not, it is not about us, is dead wrong. Well, coming to church or coming to faith, coming to worship in your house or in church on Sunday, let me make it specifically about Sunday. Coming to church on Sunday because it's something that we were told to do when we were a kid, because I always went to church when I was a kid, and I was told by my dad, my mom, you always go to church on Sunday. So if I was coming to church on Sunday because that's what I was done when I was brought up, then that's the law. If it was a tradition for my family, if I was told when I was a kid, if I'm doing it because it's the thing I should do or have to do or what I'm supposed to do, that's just the law. So I'm just following the law. I might get something out of it when I come here, but it's still just the law. I'm embracing the reality of my church by the law. If I'm coming to church because while I'm in church, I see the things of the church that reflect the reality of God, and I observe them, and they make sense to me in church on Sunday, but then when I leave, they have no real bearing on my life. That's just the law. That's coming for another reason, maybe not a tradition as a kid, but for a reason that I have imposed upon myself. I'm supposed to do this because dot, dot, dot. It may not be something I say in my brain, but it's something that I live in my life. I come, I watch the show, (laughs) I'm a little involved in it, and then I leave and it just goes away. It doesn't make any difference. That's saying that worship is all about God. This is God's place, God doing God's stuff, God being God, but that's wrong. Because if this is all about God and it doesn't, it's not about us, then it makes no difference. You might as well watch a video. Watch a video that makes you happy, makes you think about God. That's all about God. This is all about us because it's about transforming us, changing us into the people that God wants us to be. About coming here and facing the reality of God's presence in our life, the truth. And then in faith, embracing the reality of our life. All those places we've buried. All those questions that we've had. All that uncertainty that we've carried with us and embracing them, not running away from them and do something that we do or don't want to do, some crazy thing, but rather running to it, running to it and making sense of it, running to it and asking the questions. You know, I hear all the time from people. In fact, there was a youth group I really remember in, in Kilmarnock. I was at the youth group and this, one of the parents came in. It was a big youth group, 45 or 50 kids. And the, and the parent came in and was in the back. And when it was time for everyone to go out, they all ran out, and this parent came over to me, and I thought he was going to say, you know, I'll be back and later on to pick my child up, because that's what parents usually do, right? They drop the kids off and they go away. And so I thought he was going to leave. I, I was surprised he stayed. And he didn't. He said, I, he said, I, I want to thank you for the lesson that you just taught the kids, because you answered a question that I've had for years. I said, well, why, why didn't you ask the question? I mean, I'm teaching it to the kids. And he said, because I've always felt like because I'm an adult, I should already know the answer. And because I feel like I should already know the answer, to even think about asking the question makes me feel like I'm stupid. So I couldn't ask the question because 
I would be stupid to ask the question. You know what I wanted to say. <laughs> you know what the teacher says. You're stupid because you didn't ask the question. We all don't know the answers. We all have questions. The question is, when, when we want to know the answer, what do we do? When we want to know the answer, when we want to move forward, do we run over there and do that thing? Or do we run to the, to the place where we can get the answers? And are we asking and answering the questions to feed ourselves or to grow in our relationship with Christ? It's got to be number two. It's got to be number two, and it always is because the question is ultimately based on the truth, which is the person of Christ, the reality and the revelation of God, which we call faith. How do we get the answer if we don't ask the question? How do we learn if we're not open to being taught? So the first sergeant was boring, or the master sergeant was boring. No doubt about it. He droned. He was not dynamic in any way, shape, or form. And he said stuff oftentimes that was so completely redundant that there were guys that were in that, it was a big enough group that there were guys falling asleep. He didn't seem to say anything to them. I'm sure he saw them. There were guys that kind of dreamed out those little tiny portals portholes over there, there's a really small window that looked up. You couldn't see down, you had to look up. And there were a few guys who listened. And I figured out after four or five months of going through maybe a series of changes, listening to the master sergeant, that amidst his less than auspicious presentation, he had these gems. He had these truths that he had rea realized through a lifetime of learning, of doing, and they were gems that would make what we were about to do better and more understandable and more creative, and they were gems that helped inform us of what we'd already done to make sense of it. And if you really listened, you knew that when you got back to Garrison, you could go and ask him questions. Truth is called faith in us. Response is our action. What do we do with what we know is true? Therefore, our faith will be reckoned to us who believe in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.